Davos 2022. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning, especially those of you who are at our party here last night, including myself. It's a great challenge to, uh, to, to make it, and uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel this morning, the new new media, exploring the possibilities of communication and compensation in the next generation of the web, hosted by the Atlantic CEO, Nick Thompson. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here. Today is the panel where we're actually, actually gonna figure out the blockchain is gonna solve all the woes of my industry. We're gonna figure that out, or we're gonna figure it out, as someone said this morning, oh man, it's all hat, no cattle. So, we're gonna figure out the answer to that in the next 45 minutes. I'm joined here by Michael Casey. He is the Chief Content Officer of Coindesk. Before that, he was at the Wall Street Journal for 100 years. Uh, <laughs> Lila de Kretzer. Two, to be precise. <laughs> Lila de Kretzer, she's the Global Breaking News Editor at Reuters. And Jamil Anderlini, he's the Editor-in-Chief of Political Europe. I hope, I hope you'll have some forgiveness to me, Jamil, and to Lila, because last night, we were at a long, very intense dinner where nine members of the Ukrainian parliament mistook all the journalists for the actual people in the German parliament who were not giving them the tanks they need to defeat the Russians. And it led to a very awkward conversation where we wow. were like, we're just reporters. <laughs> all right, let's get going. Michael. Hello. How are you? Good. Good. Explain. Uh, voice, you know, is not where it was. You, know, you should have an event, guys. You should always try to push it to the beginning because your speakers are going to sound like my voice does right now. So just Monday's a better day to have an event because it's the quality of the voices is better. That's a very good jazz voice. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> sounds ah. good. <laughs> I like this. All right. So in your froggy, creaking voice, explain <laughs> the most interesting uses of the blockchain that you've seen in media. Okay. So I'm going to go to something that's in the, on the surface going to sound... Uh, a little obvious and boring, but NFTs are a far bigger deal than most people realize, right? Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit of an anecdote that I think has, has opened my eyes to this. And by the way, the application of NFTs is that, that I think is valuable is not actually uh, what we may think. I mean, it is definitely this, the idea that you have this provenance, that you can sort of have a, a, a sort of a serial number, if you like, and attach it to a, di a piece of digital media. And with that, I can then, you know, at least identify a connection to a... A, a file that will just be, of course, replicated and stolen and stolen anyway, right? But th that, that is useful. There is a certain amount of value in the uh, architecture and the tracking that comes with that. But the most important thing is money. Money is, money is what, make the, what makes the world go round. It is also what um, is at the heart of the core problems we face in media because it's the business models of the internet platforms. The fact that advertisers and everybody who funds that world have got, ha, are naturally being corralled into uh, an incentive system that sort of drives interest away from truth and everything else, right? We, that's the subject of this, of this conversation. But money is flowing into the creator communities of LA, of Bombay, of wherever, um, through NFTs, right? And of course, probably a lot more when the market was hoppy as it was a few months ago than there are now. But the reality is that money is, is changing things in ways that are really quite profound. And I realized this when I was in LA uh, at the NFT LA conference, and a guy came up to me, his name is Matteo Santoro. Natalia knows this story, you know Matteo. Um, and he showed me uh, a trailer that he'd made of a movie that he was working on. And it was him in a desert. It was like a Mad Max type film. And he's like fighting some gigantic robot. And it's a dust storm. And it's really, really good, really compelling. I was like, oh, I want to watch that movie. And you look at it and you think, oh, the production quality on this thing is amazing. And he said, and then somebody said, do you realize that Matteo uh, wrote, directed, uh, produced, animated, and was the single star in the whole thing? Right? The whole thing was constructed by himself. It's an expensive exercise. So it, it, the, the key point was that it was funded with NFTs. And so I was there thinking, oh, God, Universal Studios must have put stuff behind. There was no studio involved at all. So the idea that there are now creative people who do not need to get the say-so from Harvey Weinstein or somebody like that, right, but instead can make what they want to make and have this out there in the world because their fans will fund it for them is a profound thing. And why is it profound? Because it's not just that there will be other movies that are being made, but that the movies and the songs and the art and the journalism that we produce uh, is not being shaped by these gatekeepers anymore. Right? That's our culture. That's who we are. The idea that our culture is now 
being determined by a relationship between the fans, the consumers of that art, and the producers of it, is going to have a very, very, you know, extreme effect on, on society itself. Not necessarily for the better, right? But it's going to be profound. I so, thoroughly believe this. So the key thing that will happen is that we'll be getting rid of gatekeepers like Reuters and Politico Europe. Right? That's, <laughs> that's the key argument you're making here. Well, this is how we'll save the yeah, world. I, I, yeah, I quite like exactly, gatekeepers. Exactly. I quite like that. Coindesk yeah. will rise to the top and just take yeah. over the world. No, um, look, the thing is, this is where we journalists have lost the plot. We are no longer the gatekeepers. I'm sure, and you're going to have, you know, loads, now in your new role, Nick, as CEO, you're going to have your Google, Google Analytics team come in, you probably already have at the times, and looked at how this search term is performing this month versus that month, right? And you're like, God, why did, we, why did our ranking drop on this particular storyline from last week? And then the Google Analytics expert in your team's going to go, because the algorithm changed. Ah, oh, damn it, we have to figure out what our new SEO strategy is here. Who's the gatekeeper? Well, Google is the Google's gatekeeper the gatekeeper. For us. We're the gatekeeper we are, for the we, are, we journalists and we publishers are the Matteo Santoros of this world. And the, we're the same. We're being gatekept. Thankfully, we're not the Harvey Weinsteins. Okay, so <laughs> but let, let, let's go back to this NFT thing. All right, we can break down gatekeepers. There's a lot of money. Explain exactly what Political Europe and Reuters should do with NFTs, and then I'll get them to explain why they're already doing that. So what should they do? And then Leila and Jamil, you can explain why you've adopted it so quickly and why it's been such a major part of your strategy so far. Well, I mean, they should do exactly what Matteo was doing, right? They should, they should go to their audiences and build uh, business models around it. I don't think, and I don't know enough about what, what you guys are doing specifically, but I don't think it is just about the memorializing of famous covers and, and, and so forth. I think it is about building a system of engagement. I'm losing my um, Star Trek thing here. Um, it's about building fan engage about audience engagement, right? It's it's a, it's about how do I uh, create a realm in which we can now start once again to restore the relationship that used to exist between the reader and and the publisher, the writer, right? Uh, without that gatekeeper in the middle of it. So the NFT becomes a reward mechanism, an incentive system for like, do you comment? Do, do I use it as a mechanism for actually moderating those comments so I don't get all the trolls in there? Do I build uh, uh, a business model in which they are, if they participate and read and share and engage as best they can with this material, that they then get to attend an event, right? You, you build models of engagement around NFTs and NFT communities, and I think that's how we beat the bastards from, from gatekeeping us. Okay, so Jamil and Lily, you are on that. Uh, <laughs> Lily, want to answer this first? Uh, I mean, I'm the most old school person in here. I work for a news organization that tries to protect its journalists from um, the audience. You know, uh, we are a B2B <laughs> <laughs> news organization. We sell our news to news organizations like The Atlantic or Politico or wh whoever they are. We also have a financial terminal we sell to LSAG News, right? So in our... Um, minds, you know, the most important thing we do is trusted journalism, right? We lose everything if people do not believe that what we are covering is real. And quite frankly, like being removed from that audience has protected us. Now, we now have a growing digital business and we've been um, expanding in that. And I come from digital. I have to tell you, I'm less worried about whether I can interact with someone in, on an F NFT than I am that, you know, t I did, took a quick look today on OpenSea. You know, our, one of our best uh, photographers, Lucy Nicholson, is, you know, she's risked her life to go to war around the world. That has been grifted on uh, OpenSea by other people taking that copyright. Right now, in a normal environment, we could go to them. If it was Nick doing it, we'd be like, take that down or pay us a lot of money. But we can't do that in a de decentralised platform. So, you know, I'm, I'm like the to total opposite on this one. There, there, we need to build the solutions to those problems, right? That, I, that's, I, mean, the, the, I founded a company before I joined um, uh, Coindesk when I was at MIT, and it... Uh, we're building a licensing system for NFTs, and we talk about what OpenSea has enabled to be the biggest art heist in history. Yeah. So I would totally agree. So I worry a bit um, about this idea, which I think is already a big problem in the world, of journalism on demand. Like the idea like, oh, I really think that Donald Trump's an asshole and Joe Biden is amazing, so I'm going to like pay someone to tell me that. And that's what I worry about a little bit, is the traditional role of the gatekeepers is to 
you know, we, we have people with decades and decades, collectively hundreds, thousands of years of experience of weighing up facts, talking, you know, striving for this objectivity. And if you're, if you're saying we're going to get rid of all of that and we're just going to give the people what they want and that's so wonderful, I, I just think that's road to perdition. Well, uh, you've seen it on the most important scoop of the last kind of month, right? Imagine... Decade. Decade. I mean, so Roe versus Wade, a Supreme Politico Court scoop. Thank like, you. Uh, judgment gets leaked. The, the decision to publish that is, you know... Is it true? Is it true? And imagine if it wasn't a gatekeeper publishing that. Imagine if it was just a random person, you know, totally decentralised. Would we have believed it? Like the And would the they way, have checked? Because yes. they would have been, oh, my God, I'm going to get so much money from, like, just publishing this document. Everyone's going to eyeballs. I'm going to NFT the crap out of this. Uh, I can tell you, although I can't tell you anything about how that uh, story was, was, got, uh, was, was uh, found and worked on, but basically I know that that was extremely rigorous. I mean, so rigorous that, you know, we, we had to be sure that that was true. Yeah. But I actually don't think but that... Sorry, sorry. Can I pause sorry, for a second? Sorry, sorry. Why, well, I mean, you can get rid of... The, I mean, social media gets rid of the gatekeepers. I feel like we've combined a, sort of a conversation from five years ago with a conversation of right now. So you can get rid of the gatekeepers. Like, social media gets rid of gatekeepers. The whole idea is newsletters. You get rid of gatekeepers. I was just doing a podcast talking about how we're trying to kind of half get rid of the gatekeepers by having subscriber-only newsletters. You don't need NFTs to get rid of the gatekeepers. NFTs do all kinds of other stuff. So explain why NFTs are the best way to get rid of the gatekeepers and why else we should be focusing on them. Because I don't want to okay, merge I, these I two think, conversations. I think it is about community and engagement, right? I think, I think that people, like the Board Ape Yacht Club, you can, you know, say what you like about it. It's a bunch of, you know, rich kids all, you know, touting, flexing with their, with their apes. It's not exactly, you know, the most exciting form of art. But it is a profound experiment in uh, the advance of community. The idea that you bring these people together around a value that they share and how you can then transfer that to so many other realms, right? The conversation going on around environmental causes and NFTs, all of this is about that. It's about community. So what do we have? What do we used to have as journalists? We used to have loyal Atlantic readers and loyal political readers. And we, we were able to, they would, and now, yes, we're bringing back the subscriber model and that's bringing it back and that's a great thing. But this is a mechanism for how you can build that. So I wouldn't ever... I would structure the relationship, right? I wouldn't say, you tell us what you want and we're going to report that. By the way, that's what the SEO thing does, right? S the, being a slave to SEO is precisely being a slave to what people want. What I'm saying is, like, we're going to write what we think you should read and, and we think you like it. Uh, we know you like it, in fact, but your attention is going all over the place. What we want to do is capture that intention and have you engage with us. And we're going to reward you for that, right? So NFTs are a rewarding system. They're an incentive system. They're a mechanism. That's what makes them different from everything else, is that it's the two-way flow is there, but you get to set the terms of what that two-way flow is. Now, there are a lot of ways that journalistic organizations could use blockchain technology, right? You could put sourcing information. You could put you know, reporting on the blockchain. You could sell your NFTs of your old covers. You could use them as a way to you know, give rights to people who send you photographs. Are either Reuters or Political Europe using any of these mechanisms? And if not, why not? And so <clears throat> we've done a NFT on, I believe, a photograph. Um, and, you know, it was mostly so we could experiment with it and see how it went. I mean, it was the first go. Um, and it was about recognising also, I think, something that's really important to us, the individual photographer. And I, that is where I do agree with you. I think the, the sort of uh, the artistic thing about being a journalist, the thing that you own, your byline, your, your photography, uh, like I like the idea about NFTs for that. Where, where we're sceptical is that, you know, the, the authentication um, and also ownership, you know, the fact that someone else can put their um, barcode, as you said, mm -hmm. on my work, claim it, um, you know, the, the Roe versus Wade biggest scoop of the century, it doesn't stop you from NFTing, <laughs> NFTing it, right? So, and that's where I think we still need to, we have a long way to go. Right. Long way to go is right. I mean, but that doesn't mean that the path is not in the right direction. Yeah, we're definitely not doing any of that. Um, I would say that I've been a journalist 20 years. This is an industry that's been kind of crushed in the last 20 years. And I think we're just coming out of the sort of how do you cut people in a nice way? You know, how do you fire people in a nice way? And like, how do we build this industry back up? I personally believe we're at the dawn of the golden age of media. Uh, oh. um, yeah. But I don't... Glad to hear. Writing that down. Write it down. Write it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You and me, Nick. So, uh, but... Um, I don't think necessarily that 
it may well involve you know new technologies of all kinds nfts blockchain may certainly be part of that but i think just the very basics of hiring journalists and getting them to do great journalism and then finding out good business models which i think politico basically has and others the new york times and Washington Post and maybe not Reuters yet, but um, no, no, you'll get we're that. very get healthy. That. <laughs> uh, um, but I think that we're, we're just at that kind of rebuilding the industry stage. We're not thinking sort of cool bells and whistles. I, I, uh, nowhere near. I mean, that's where we're at. But it's working out the business model, the basic more, business. Model. It's, it's more than bells and whistles, though, right? It's fundamental. It's not about. But if we can't, if we are just barely coming out of like laying off hundreds of thousands sure. of journalists every couple of years, are we even? thinking about what this was. But it was, the, it was the structure of the Web 2 internet that led you to have to fire all those journalists. It's, right? it's, that, it's, it's the fundamental structure of that model that has led us to this. So, well, I mean, be, but that's... Figuring out how to get out of it. That, that's critical. shifted in the last five years, right? Now, so, I mean, I, I come from a company that I think we had 9% growth in, like, uh, last year. You know, we, there were a lot of media companies doing really well because they shifted to adapt. Now, you know, Web 2.0 has actually done pretty well for places like The Times, mm -hmm. The Wall Street Journal. But we've only just managed to do it. Right. And, and that's coming out. I mean, we have, you know anyone who's a journalist here, we have 100 jobs open right now, right? Like, uh, many news organisations are in a actual fight for talent. It's much more talent. fun to work for <laughs> No. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a fight for talent. You know, the, the industry isn't in the same crisis that we thought we were at the beginning of Web 2.0, and I, I hope we won't go into crisis because of Web 3.0. Fair enough. Well, okay, so let's, here we go, let's make the argument that Web 3.0 it's going to be much better for the media than Web 2.0 was at the beginning, where our advertising models were disrupted and you know the advertising business went away and all these changes happened. Okay. So I'm going to be a bit provocative, but I'm going to take a different position. I don't know that in the interest of society, right, because this is the biggest crisis, not yeah. that journalists are getting laid off. It's that truth is being undermined, right? And, and when, uh, you know, colleagues of mine, I mean, in our industry, because I've been a journalist all my life, were being pointed to by a certain president at rallies and told that you are enemies of the people and that that became the standard understanding of what the press role is, I think that was um, about as big a symbol of how big a crisis society is in as you can imagine. So the issue really is that, is like how do we bring the profession of journalism, whether it's a, a, a lone subscriber writer or, you know, a big however 150 years old, how old is what is yep. year old institution, um, you know, so that their work actually is trusted and is valuable and, and, and makes a difference in democracy. That's the most important issue. And I don't think that but the fact that the New York Times and Politico and others are now profitable again because they've got subscribers is fixing that problem. Okay, right? so let's talk about truth because this is like one of the most interesting things to me about Web 3.0 and blockchain, right? Because it could this be an awesome system for verifying information. It could really increase trust and truth. It could be great, like, theoretically. It is also a central source of bullshit. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And in part because there's so many scams and so many grifts, but also in part because everybody who's involved in it has a conflict of interest because they yeah. own coins. Sure. And so all everybody, Kevin Roos said something in this conversation with you. It was this wonderful conversation podcast you did a couple months ago, and he said, no one who has any authority is trusted and no one is trusted as any authority. Basically, everybody who deeply understands Web3 has a massive conflict of interest because they own a bunch of coins, yeah. right? So it's this system where everybody is hyping it up, where there's tons of drift, but it is also the system that could be used for truth. So... Explain <laughs> how we get from grift world to truth to world. truth world, yeah. And then well, Leland Jamil. It's really easy, you know. Okay. Fixing truth is, is simple. Great. So then when we get from grift world to truth world, then will you guys adopt it? So <laughs> <laughs> take Look, I mean, all of that is absolutely true. And just to just, to, just add anecdotes, right? I mean, my, my journalists are in the middle of more than any of you guys have to deal with because you'll write some story and all of a sudden there is a tribe of people who hold the particular coin that is being negatively reflected in the story that you get and you will now have a troll army attacking you because they can only see one truth and it is connected to whatever they see the value of that coin. So 100%, this is a really messy, difficult, grift-driven sort of world. Um, but, but again, that sort of like obscures what needs to happen here. And, and you know, it, it is... How do we recognize the reality that 
you know, information has been decentralized. It is, the internet is completely open, in, in, unless, you know, you can find some places like Russia where they'll shut it down. But it is essentially this, this big open access place, which has meant that, you know, the authorities of truth have been flattened. And that's actually not always a bad thing. Um, but in that environment, right, how do we create mechanisms by which we can start to verify things and build a sense of what that authority is. So the concept of provenance that is you know, inherent to a blockchain, right? that, OK, I can see where this transaction has gone, is a building block. I am not saying that it fixes it, because as everybody knows, even if I can put a serial number on you know, a, a, an FT certificate on this particular photo, somebody can still right click that and NFT that and put it onto uh, uh, OpenSea under the current architecture, right? But there are people, folks at Polkadot and the Web3 Foundation are working to fix these things, right? How do we start to bring really much tighter connections to the digital files that are the heart of how these things go? And then what do we do with our ability to verify things? Can we now look at a deep fake and say, okay, just as we now have you know, SSL certificates to show that, okay, this is clearly a website I don't trust because it doesn't have the little lock on it, I can look at, uh, a piece of media and see in some way, I don't trust this. This just didn't come back from where it should have based upon this architecture. There's a lot there that can be built. But you know, look, talk to Polkadot about how you get from uh, the basic beginnings, the building block, which mm -hmm. is this blockchain provenance concept. And what do we need to do to tie everything else into it? A lot of it is, uh, is, is about tech, but as Frank McCourt here and I were discussing earlier, it's also about how do we as a society start to recognize authorities and, 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 and use this data as a way to then ascribe authority and trust to outsiders. It's a really difficult, complex exercise, but it's more than just saving journalists' jobs. It's fixing democracy. Well, I mean, I think one way you get rid of grifters is a crash, right? So we're going through that right now. And, and in, in most situations where a market collapses, a lot of the really bad guys either get, get away with it or they lose their shirts. And I do think what's happening with crypto's crash is authentication is becoming now something that people are talking about with decentralization. The problem there is, like, you'll need custodians, right? Because like, when you're talking about truth, you're not just talking about authentic authenticating ownership. It's... It's kind of cool to think about how blockchain could verify information truthfully. How could they take your brain or my brain as an editor that is this truthful, are we being objective, and, and actually play that role in uh, distributing information. But, I mean, I think if we could go back to those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. in creation, right? Like, you know, if we could get with the technologists, if there's a way to create that way, that's where it's going to be. But I do think verification, authentic authenticity are going to be the like next focuses of Web3. That's where they'll have to spend their time. Jamil? I just argue that the, the, the main thing you need uh, to say whether it's truthful or not is Politico, FT, Wall Street <laughs> Journal, New York yeah. Times across the top of it. I actually think the whole, when this whole thing years ago now, uh, feels like an age, uh, when fake news became a thing, right? Everyone started talking about fake news, fake news. Everyone's like, oh, this is bad for our industry. I was like, that's the best thing that's happened to our industry because there's so much crap out there on the internet and it's so embarrassing to walk in and talk to your friends and be like, oh, did you see so-and-so just start? And they're like, no, they didn't. Uh, you know, the one time you read a bit of fake news and then tell your friends about it and get embarrassed about it, you're never going to do that again. You're going to buy a subscription to a credible news organization which has fact checkers and which has all these industries. So I, I just I think that properly, you know, these proper traditional style news organizations are the best, in well, many ways, arbiters of, of the truth. Because we have these processes and hundreds of years of practice yeah. of... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm building one myself, right? I mean, that we've, we've been hiring people from all those institutions for that very purpose. We believe in the whole thing, but I just think we need to think much bigger than that, right? Yeah, would you be, let's, let's stick on this for a second because I, I'm totally with you. I, everything I read in Politico, I trust. Like the Atlantic, fact check everything. Every single thing we do, we put a lot of care and thought into it. Nobody believes us. Have you seen our trust ratings? Our trust ratings stink. They and believe they're going our down. content. Right. They don't believe, they don't trust us as they, they lead. They trust us. They don't trust us as much as they used to. They trust, they trust our content. To. They trust uh, our content. They don't trust you because they believe you're It's a, it's a schizophrenic relationship. Let, let me audience. put it this way. <laughs> uh, we got some trust. We lack some trust. If there were a mechanism out there 
that could increase the trust of the Atlantic, whether it's blockchain, whether it's Web 3.0, whether it's the industrial metaverse in you know, 6G, I don't know. If there were some mechanism that could entrust, increase the trust in my reporting, I would take it, even though we are trusted. So if the wonderful folks at Polkadot can build a system for verifying information more accurately than it is verified right now, will you use it? Or do you think that you don't need to? Yeah, but I would uh, trust then verify. I wouldn't be certain that this uh, technology, I mean, right. how can you be sure that an algorithm is, is and like I said, we've, we've been doing this for a long time and it's like you, you build up, you have senior editors who've done it for decades and decades. There is and it's hundreds of years of practice of like getting to the truth, the objective truth. We're always trying to get better. We're always trying to improve. But I just don't, I personally don't believe that machines are going to solve that in the near future. We would yeah. totally use it in this sense. Um, you know, we've been, we've been playing sort of, because trust is our whole brand, right? Like one thing I will say is we're trusted. And where, we, where we've been seeing an opportunity for us is in visuals, right? The trust of what something looks like. So you know, we've been kind of playing in that space to be able to identify deep fakes. And I think if that's something that, you know, we could work with with Web3, I, I totally, that's where we want to be. We want to know that every photo we ever publish is true. That is inherent to our brand. We have to know that, right? So, you know, that, that stuff. I mean, the other thing I was thinking for this is think about Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. You know, journalists who were on the ground there, um, the ability for them to get their information out easily without gatekeepers is actually hugely important, right? Now, we send teams in, um, but, you know, we, we're a large news organisation. Like every large news organisation, we've got insurance, we've got issues. There are journalists on the ground there who are doing amazing jobs. If they can get their information out and that can be verified, that is, like, you know, a win. Right. Without getting too philosophical... No, know, no, get as what, philosophical as you want. What's the meaning Davos, of truth? It's early, right? everybody's yeah. hungover, just go for it. Ooh, <laughs> what's the meaning of truth, though, here? Like, so if we say, well, OK, so Reuters and Politico are known as non-partisan. You know, we're, we're specifically and very consciously non-partisan, but that's not the case for most media organisations today. So the truth for Fox News and for Fox News viewers is very different from the New York Times and New York Times viewer, you know, readers. And I think that's where you get, so, so if you are a left-wing publication, say, are you going to go into the algorithm and say, and into the, the, you know, the verification structure and say, well, yes, but we need to tilt it a little bit because there, you know, the truth is that, uh, you know, we believe in, in this. And so that's where I think it's, it's really so difficult. And that's where humans are going to be better than machines, better than computers mm -hmm. for, Centuries, maybe. They have Centuries, OK. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, yeah. We're going to go to audience questions briefly. Let me ask Michael one, one more question, which is, we've been talking about blockchain and media for a while. There's a whole company, Civil. A bunch of my yeah, friends yeah. went to go work for it, right? Like, yep, yep. lots of people. Lots of people have been working on blockchain and media. Not a lot has happened. Time has had made a great business selling NFTs. Time, totally into it, right? They did a fabulous job, made a lot of money, did a lot of interesting work. But most journalistic organizations have not moved headlong into any of the 15 things that have been proposed. Is that because we're crusty and conservative? Or is that because it hasn't been quite ready for us? So, Michael, I want you to take uh, a crack at that and let's go to audience Q&A. I have to say a bit of both, right? I mean, look, um, there is, uh, I used to, when I used to give sort of a brief period between my journalism career and my new journalism career, I was uh, uh, as at MIT as, as a researcher and I made my money as a public speaker. And I used to get up and say, um, you know, one of the lines I would use, blockchain is a we technology, not a me technology. And, and unfortunately, most people still see it as a me technology. I'm like, how do I protect mine? How do I make my money? How do I put my NFT on OpenSea and make a lot of money? But the reality is it's a mechanism for coordination. And I, and I think that what will, what's going to have to happen is a lot of these, a lot of media organizations are actually going to have to come together in the way that they built something like the Associated Press and say, how do we treat something like a blockchain verified platform as a utility that we collectively share and own and fund both for the public good but most importantly for our own interests right that exercise of bringing all these competing media organizations actually isn't easy because they regard themselves as the arbiters of the truth right um, so there has to be that's one that's resistance to it but yes the other part of the, the, the tech isn't ready and, it, and when people say like you know it's still early is a line that you hear in blockchain a lot and People roll their eyes. I can see a guy closing his eyes, shaking his head just over there. Um, because it's been said a lot and you go, oh, God, it's, been, it's actually 13 years since 
Satoshi's, no, it's, it's yes, 13 years, right, since Satoshi's white paper. It's, you can't say that anymore. Well, you know what? This is a technology that is trying to completely rewire governance structures. It is trying to take on financial, the financial system that was created by the Medici 500 years ago. Like, this is not something you snap your fingers and go, hmm, okay, NFTs, that fixes everything. There's all of these layers that we need to build together. Societally, right? Technology, everything. So it, this is a long, long road. Um, that, that, that's what I would just say. And, and, you know, I think that we'll get there. I think there are, you know, and, and when I joined Coindesk, I said, we need to be just not just writing about Web3. We need to become a Web3 media company. But we're only just starting to experiment now. We have a, a desk token that we'll be uh, distributing at consensus that you all must come to, seamless bug. We make our money, by the way, from, a, from an event. That's how we pay <laughs> like for media things. media companies. Too. So, you know, <laughs> so um, come to that event. Use our desk token to participate, engage, and then we're trying to think: What do we do with that? Can we then use that to start to build different business models that might help CoinDesk in the broader media undertakings that we have? So anyway, that was a, I, did, I took your question and turned it into a plug, but that's okay, right? That's, that's yeah. it's it's a blockchain panel. Um, all right, um, <laughs> right here in the second row. Yeah. Edwin, please um, take the microphone. State your name your favorite meme coin, Although it will help for the broadcast. Christian asked the first question on the panel I had yesterday at Davos, and it was the most hostile question of the lot. It was no, a good, good question. Oh, if it's hostile, please direct it at one <laughs> of those. Nothing. Up. Okay, this is not hostile at all, but I think uh, my question would be, we're sitting here in this decentralized space, and you're talking a lot about essentially centralizing truth, right? Because you're saying, we the news organizations, we the gatekeepers, are the centralized source of the truth. Um, so I'm wondering if you see a schism there and, you know, I mean, you didn't talk a whole lot about Substack and a lot of these other bottom-up uh, places that are coming up. So I was curious about how you see that sort of tension. And I like what you said about there's many truths probably because the second question I have is, is there really that big at a market for, for truths as we think, right? I mean, there's definitely many, many subscribers to Fox News, right? And uh, not saying anything about that journalistic integ integrity, but it seems the truth is not necessarily always the most popular product. So that was my two questions. Is truth a popular product? And one, aren't you just centralizing uh, truth? Yeah, so I mean, that's the biggest flaw in my argument. And, and honestly, the, where, where it's the weakest is like the talent, right? So what, where, where truth and, and, and news organizations probably have a problem is if they haven't actually got the right journalists working for them. And I think Substack, I'm not sure it's Web3, but I do think what it touched on was that you need you know, diverse views, you need people who see the world differently to be working for you and presenting news. And I think if Web3 can do that, that's fantastic. I worry it's probably diverse and crap, right, which is going to be not so great for, you know, wanting to read it. But I do think where news organisations have a problem is if they do not have the best and most diverse and alternative views sitting inside to help them <coughs> with truth. And we've seen that. They don't, right? They're still dominated with you know, a lot of times uh, the same people that have always been there. So I, I, I think you're right, but I'm not sure Web3 is the way to go because I also think there what you end up with is too wide of a stream. That's my view. Uh, we had a question in the back in the blue suit. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Oscar Franklin Tan. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Engine. We're building the Metaverse Parachain on Polkadot. Uh, Nick, before I ask my question, I just wanted to mention that you, you mentioned Civil. Uh, the founder, uh, Christine Mohan, is actually in this conference uh, and is part of a, a Polkadot project called Kilt Protocol. Is that her? Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> so there are definitely people thinking about that uh, great vision in this ecosystem. But So I, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, we, we would love to see Truth NFTs alongside Ape NFTs, uh, see Web3 improve journalism. You know, I'm from a developing country. You know, I'm, fr I'm from the Philippines. Um, we talk about these issues. We just had our elections. Um, but the truth is, we see more headlines about apes you know, than about truth, than about uh, scaling robotics networks, digital identity, and all the amazing things being talked about in this conference. Um, and I guess there are good reasons for that, but you know, how can these gatekeepers with decades of experience help steer conversation, the truth, and all of this amazing infrastructure and you know, away from the BS? Uh, should you be you know, part of that? Absolutely, we should be part of it. Yeah, that's our, that's our mission, right? To be... You should see my, my notepad right here. 
in this little block. I'm taking notes in this conversation. So before you ask your question, I wrote, could the Atlantic do blockchain verified facts and license them out like Reuters stories? <laughs> uh, note to self to record on my DAO. So it's an interesting idea, right? Could you actually do it? But the problem, okay, so then what stories would come in? How would we verify them? Would we have, we have about six fact checkers? Like, it, I was trying to think through exactly how it would work. It's hard. It's reasonably easy to mint an NFT and sell it. It's hard to figure out both what is the demand for the facts? How would you process the facts? How would you verify the facts? But I'd love to have that happen. So someone's got a great idea or wants to fund my new business that I've just started <laughs> as the Atlantic's next new revenue stream. I'm in. The, the, the key point is the business part of it, right? I think, well, it's, it's a, one of the key. There are also technological issues. But the verification, there are systems out there. Anyone know the Project Starling uh, out of Stanford? Um, you know, this is a... They really working with journalists and you know uh, the judi judicial authorities actually to try to come up with blockchain-based standards for verification, and they they've done things like record um, the testimonies of Holocaust victims to show that there's this thing that could be lost that is so important as to humanity that we need to remember that we keep in this in this record. And now they're working very closely with fact checkers in Ukraine to try to record in a in a you know lasting censorship-resistant way verifiable facts around war crimes in Ukraine. So, and those things are extremely valuable to journalism and how we then build on that and, and, and sort of, I suppose, essentially as strengthen the trust in Politico and Reuters and, and, and Coindesk, right? That I think is really valuable. It's still, the question remains, how do you make money, right? Because the, the money thing is the challenge. I mean, just want to, always want to use this anecdote. I think it's really, really important. Um, you remember the Macedonian story, the story about the Macedonian website? BuzzFeed had this great story, 2016, and these kids had figured out in Macedonia that they could just make a lot of Google Sense money from their ads, little tiny like auto ads, um, if they wrote a pile of bullshit and just fed it into the Facebook algorithm. Uh, because, why? Because it was bound to get much more traction from people who had a really strong political view that was connected to that lie. So there were stories like, Donald, uh, Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump. Uh, Obama's birth certificate found in uh, Kenya. And they made bucket loads of money in Macedonia. Why? Because the Facebook algorithm was de specifically designed to create like audiences, it meant that those audiences were resharing and sharing and tweeting and putting it out there. And like, wow, did you see this? Thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets. And the thing that got me was like, oh my God, we spend, we put, Journalists out in the field, at great risk themselves, enormous cost. We have layers of editing. We have lawyers that fact the checks. We do this massive process to get the truth right, and we're being out-competed precisely because it's a lie. What is the problem there? The problem is Facebook's business model, which was built around platform-based advertising that drove them and corralled people into these organized centers. And that's what's driven it. It's capitalism and the actual structure of the return on shareholders of Facebook. So we've got to figure out the business. I'm not saying I have the answers, but you were right to say, how do I make money out of it? Because unless we figure that out, we're stuck. All right. So. Jamil, I come to you and I'm like, hey, I've created this Atlantic system, blockchain verified facts. You know, you take a meeting with me because I think I can, you know, I can help you out. Do you, is your instinct like, Jesus Christ, the stupid blockchain crap? Or is it, oh, okay, I'm going to take that think? meeting. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Have you been listening to me? So, uh, no, I mean, I would, I would say, well, who are you? You know, we have our fact checkers. We have our editors. We have our journalists. We have processes. We're nonpartisan. We get a left-wing person and a right-wing person to look at each story. I personally, as the editor-in-chief, I'm supposed to make sure we're nonpartisan, and I do that with a whole lot of internal processes. Do I need The Atlantic to tell me that? Definitely yes, not. My You're business is done, well, so. alas. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure others might. <laughs> but, um, next question from the audience, right here in the front row. I think there's a disconnect here, and I want to go back to Michael's point about... Um, oh, wait, say, uh, say who you are. Oh, sorry. Gennaro Durso uh, from Miami Genetic Networks and PharmaDAO. Um, Michael talked about gatekeepers. I'd like the panel to... What is a gatekeeper? It's not you. I think that was Michael's point. It's the Facebooks. It's the Googles. It's the bigger entities out there that are driving dollars into your organization. I think he's <coughs> talking about using NFTs and Web3 to have people out there in the world, provide dollars, but not tell you what to write. They trust you to write the right things, and they're supporting you. That's, I think, what we have to find. And 
You know, I'm trying to do that in the pharmaceutical industry. That's the biggest one in the world, 1.7 trillion. But it's controlled by big pharma. But we can still be like we can still be little gatekeepers with our gates and our sheep on a big industrial farm owned by Facebook, right? So you can have two gatekeepers on the Facebook farm. But also, actually, the most successful media have been subscribe in the last five, ten years. Yeah. Uh, it's all subscriber based, right? So we are gatekeepers, and in, in that someone pays for our and and actually Google and Facebook, we've disintermediated them, if you like, because we charge. Mm. Oh, subscription. I, I mean, think we might talk about having disintermediated them more than that's actually occurred. Like, yeah. I mean, ad advertising is still the you know largest. But, but your readers also aren't coming to you directly. I mean, very few people are typing. No, in not for They're us. coming I'm from Google. They're coming from most of us. But also, let's let's also remember this. Like, I remember when I was at the Wall Street Journal, and I thought that the um, biggest threat to us journalists, uh, where the media internet that's came along, was citizen journalists. That they were going to come along yeah. and the web bloggers were going to get us. And it wasn't until I realised that the biggest threat we had, that we were all thrown onto the ridiculous hamster wheel that Facebook and, and social media had created. And we were all tweeting and blogging and vote podcasting and everything else, just trying to get audience eyeballs. And yes, the solution became subscriptions. Right? That, though, is the privilege of the pre-existing trusted entities. Right? And so the this is fine. Is only right? We can sit up old. here without, you know. I was. You know, I don't I, think that's right, but keep going. Well, I, I, I think, you know, how do you create trust? So how do you build sufficient trust to then get a subscription model? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there's the Substrack and model out there, but some of those things are built around, you know, how do I just get a rise out of people, and how do I maybe lie? Did right? You, you said you were you, you came from civil, right? So I mean, that's a good organisation to look at. Um, I have some friends. Uh, Block Club, Block Club Chicago was. Yeah. Uh, you know, is if, if anyone is from Chicago, please subscribe. It's a fantastic publication, and they use Web3. But they did it by creating gatekeepers. Like, I would trust Seamus Toomey and Jen Sabella with the news. They set up traditional news operations. They may have used your technology, but that is what they did. And so th that is still a gatekeeper. You need those people, right? So that, I think that's what we mean when we talk about gatekeepers. Well, I know I absolutely agree with these guys that there has to be like news cannot be just what everybody wants. In the very act of, of being a journalist is to make that curation decision. The, the, the challenge is how do you, and I mean this again from the broad perspective, not just whether Politico is making money on its new subscription model, but rather how do we get everybody to trust journalists, and and um, and so that that curation responsibility is treated for the, with the respect that it deserves. Christine, and, you want to jump in here? Yeah. So yes, sir. Hi, uh, Christine Mohan. I was co-founder of Civil, um, and I then went to Polkadot, and now I'm at Kill Protocol, which is identity verification and uh, some interesting crossover with what you're discussing, um, how to verify news, data, photos, video, all of that. Um, my question is a little bit different. Um, many of us came from either Wall Street Journal, New York Times to go to civil, and then some people went back and they went into the digital units, the innovative units, um, where they continued to experiment with things like SEO, um, AI. Do your uh, companies have plans to hire of the 100 job listings, yeah, that's people the with blockchain experience? to test into these authentication mechanisms? Yeah, I think Nick's wrong. I don't think the answer is him starting yet another company that may do well then becomes Facebook and Google. What I would like to see is us being able to hire the right technologists. I mean, you know, that's what we need. We need, we are the wire service. We already do what you were just describing, but our technology is not yet, you know, we have to advance that technology. And I think that marriage has to be a lot better. There's still a lot of suspicion between old school newspaper publishers and in some ways web publications are still old school newspaper publications and technologists and where we go from there may be the future. I got a bunch of dev jobs open. If someone has <laughs> blockchain experience, I will totally <laughs> prioritize that 100%. Um, we have one minute and 30 seconds, so we'll go to quickly quick questions and quick answers right there. Right there, yeah. Yes, please. I missed the when you said that Nick is wrong. I wasn't sure what you said, but we'll discuss you that. You don't need your own new company. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> I don't, I, that's fine. Please. That was 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Standing the panel by 45 Just, seconds. Go. Okay. Whew. All right. So Catherine Cunningham, CEO of Ecosphere, Emerging Economy Ecology, and um, CEO of um, Natural Intelligence Media. And I just wonder if there's a positive carrot to develop the fandom which your organizations need. And could that possibly be those citizen journalists who are rising now just because they want to express themselves in their voice, like trying, if there's a way that you could help 
educate them or create some sort of division in your organization that embraces this flood of new voices in the house that you can't create a fortress around because it's happening um, on the platform to then just empower people to speak their truth. So, so I, I, I got this idea recently that I was really excited about. Like we would, so CoinDesk, uh, you know, in our sort of um, expansion plans, we do lot, lots of media organizations do, we try to find affiliates out there that we uh, license, they can license our content. They go through a vetting process, you know, do you, do you have, carry the same editorial standards as us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you get it, okay, you are now CoinDesk Japan or CoinDesk Korea or whatever, largely doing it in a language sense. But I was talking to a, some members of a, of a creator DAO who were doing, they had a DAO that was publishing information about what they cared about. And a DAO, as many of you would know, a decentralized autonomous organization, is a different form of governance. And some of them are crazy and don't work, and some of them are really quite sophisticated. And it occurred to me that in addition to the idea of citizen journalists that you might just like hire on a contracted basis, and there's plenty of freelancing, right? there's a thing that news organizations have been doing for years. Um, more powerfully, potentially, is this idea that you, you might actually figure out ways to license your content or engage in a different way with a DAO. You would vet the DAO's governance and you would see whether or not it's, it's performing to the governance standards that you need for the quality of that. And now all of a sudden you've expanded your reach, your audience, and there's a revenue share arrangement or something like that. You know, I think I'm giving Nick ideas here and now Atlantic are gonna go and steal this one and build the first Atlantic DAO, aren't you? Yeah, but it's done. Okay. It's done. <laughs> I've already anyway, texted I, it to I my colleagues. I think in, there's various interesting ways that this technology can make that an even stronger proposition is what I'm saying. All right. Closing thoughts. Do you want to respond to that either Jamila or Leela or give us one brilliant insight to wrap the, wrap the party? Absolutely. I mean, we need to find ways that our you know, community is adapted so that we have a better group of people doing journalism. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all very much. Fun. We'll be back fun, uh, unpacking the blockchain sustainability debate in about 15 minutes. Thank you.